one-arm handstands. You either love them or you've learned to hate them or you know nothing about them. But no matter what, you got to respect them. We've all done two-arm handstands and possibly tried a one-arm handstand before. So we know, or at least we can imagine, that one-arm handstands are very difficult. Before we're about to get started with the actual episode, right away from the start, yes, we are going to discuss the biggest question of them all. Why are you rotating out of your one-arm handstand? I'm going to tell you what you're doing wrong, what you got to fix, and what are the right exercises for you to stop rotating out of your one-arm handstand. But we're going to get to that in a little bit. Welcome to Handstands and the Rest. I'm your host, Coach Bachmann, and I'm here to explain to you how to do handstands, how to train calisthenics, how to get stronger, and how to gain skills, but also how to get more flexible, and how to put all of this into a well-balanced and sustainable workout plan. Today's episode, as you already know, is about the one-arm handstand. If you want to get a free customized one-arm handstand workout, then make sure to click on the link down in the description below. Work your way through the customization, punch in the email address, and I will send you your very own customized handstand training workout right away. I've spent my entire life training one-arm handstands. It might sound cocky, but I truly believe that there's almost no one else in the world who has spent as much time training, thinking about, and teaching one-arm handstands in the entire world. I've taught week-long seminars about one-arm handstands. I've taught weekend workshops about one-arm handstands. Trust me, I could talk about one-arm handstands all day for the next couple days. We can make 25 or 30 episodes just about one-arm handstands. Today, I want to take the most essential things and I want to boil them down for you into one short, condensed and compact episode to get you started training for the one-arm handstand, to fix your biggest problems in the one-arm handstand, and to help you break through existing plateaus in the one-arm handstand journey. The first thing that we're going to discuss today are prerequisites. And usually when I talk about prerequisites, people, they don't get angry at me, but there are some mixed opinions. Because who am I to tell you what you have to do before you do another thing? And now don't get me wrong. I don't think that you should wait to fulfill all of these prerequisites before you start working on one-arm handstand drills. I even think that you should start implementing some one-arm handstand training skills and protocols into your handstand training before you're even able to hold a freestanding handstand. This is going to allow you to build advanced strength, coordination, and body awareness, making your wall walks, your wall takeoffs, everything so much easier, allowing you to accelerate your journey towards the freestanding and eventually the one-arm handstand significantly. If you want to do this one-arm handstand training and the one-arm handstand skills to get your one-arm handstand, then your prerequisites need to be on point. Prerequisites being your straight two-arm handstand needs to be good. It needs to be very good. And I'm not saying you need to hold for 10 minutes, you need to hold it for five minutes, nothing like this. What I'm saying is you want to be able to do a straight handstand with your legs together, you want to move one leg out to the straddle, back together to the straight handstand, and possibly even down to the tuck and back up. If you can do these kind of single leg isolations without losing balance, without bending your elbows, and really without any kind of trouble, then I would say you are ready to really expect gains towards the one-arm handstand. Other things that are going to be very helpful are a little bit of handstand push-up strength, and a little bit of press the handstand planche kind of strength, because you're going to fall out of certain exercises. If you have this extra strength, you're going to be able to push yourself back up. If every single time something goes a little bit wrong, you completely fall out, it's going to be difficult to really get training. Additionally, having a certain amount of hands and endurance is also really going to help. Because here's the thing. Let's imagine you're only able to hold your hands in for, say, 20 seconds. Realistically, it's going to take you 20 seconds to get to your one-arm hands in. We jump up. We fix the position, we straddle the legs, we align ourselves for the one-arm handstand, we gain confidence, we feel good about ourselves, and then we take our hand off. Now, this took you 15 to 18 or maybe even 20 seconds. You've invested all the energy and basically upside-down time that you have available to get to your one-arm handstand, to the thing that's going to take the most energy, which means if it's going to take us 20 seconds to set ourselves up for the one-arm handstand, you want to be able to hold at least 40 or 50 seconds. Now... If you're training one-arm handstands with me, your handstand endurance, if you want it or not, will increase significantly. So you don't have to worry about that. This is not necessarily a prerequisite, but it's something that's going to help you tremendously on your way towards the one-arm handstand. Getting a little bit more interesting right away, how do I actually do a one-arm handstand? What is the precise technique? And here is, if you didn't get angry about my prerequisite shopping list, most people get pretty upset here because I have a pretty strict rule when it comes to one-arm handstands. Technique is not up for debate. Many people argue that all the ways go to Rome and 
you can do your one arm handstand however you want. You just need to feel it in the body and all of this. They're not wrong. Like, if you get really, really strong and you just repeat the same exercise over and over and over and over again, eventually it's going to go into your body and you're going to achieve your one-arm handstand. It's not going to be sustainable. It's not going to be healthy for you. It's not something that you can build on and then do more advanced one-arm handstands. It's not going to be fun, and especially it's not going to be pretty. But it will work. Don't get me wrong. Everything that I'm telling you today is going to help you get your one-arm handstand faster and better and healthier but you can still get your one-arm handstand not following any of the recommendations that I do here. You just have to get really, really strong and it's going to work. If we look at Olympic sports, say Olympic weightlifting, swimming, sprinting, these kind of sports, athletic sports, if you look at the 10 best players in the world, you're always going to realize that they have pretty much exactly and precisely the same technique. Because over years of research, we have realized that there is a correct way to run. There is a correct way to lift heavy weights and there's a correct way to do handstands. Now, you're not starting out as a child, growing, molding into this technique. So you need to take this perfect technique. We need to adjust it towards your current body type, towards your current characteristics. We need to work with what we have, but we need to always improve the small little details, like say scapular elevation or middle split flexibility, to get towards this perfect technique. Because this perfect technique is the most sustainable one the most healthy one, and the one that you can truly build on. You're never going to just have your one-arm handstand technique. It's always going to be an up and down. If you stop training, technique is going to go away a little bit. You need to refresh it. You need to bring it back. It's a constant piece of work. And hopefully, if we do it right, a consistent little bit of daily or weekly improvements. When we now actually do a one-arm handstand, what happens to the body in order? First thing, we're on two hands. We're doing a two-arm handstand. Our elbows are locked, the scapula is elevated, the core is engaged. All of these things that we know from a two-arm handstand are still true here. If you don't know the basic rules of the two-arm handstand, I encourage you, either right now or once we're done with this episode, go back one episode and listen to the How to Get Started with Handstands episode because there I really explain in detail how to do a two-arm handstand. Now, the first thing that's always going to happen when we want to go to one hand is that we look at the hand that we're about to stand on. I've spoken to countless professional, very high-level hand balancers, and every single one of them looks slightly in a different place in the hand. Yet, every single one of them agrees that looking at the first knuckle or in general at your own hand is going to be the most convenient and most efficient thing. Also, every single one of them said, now that they're able to one-arm handstand, they've spent so much time getting good at handstands, they will not change again where they look. So I encourage you, from the very start, look at your hand. Look at your first knuckle. If you're looking at the floor next to your hand, depending on the floor that you're standing on, or maybe you're going to be on something on parallels or on canes, something higher, something lower, the distance of your eye to the floor, and with that, your focus changes and makes things significantly harder. Talking about your hand, spread your hand wide. The wider you spread your hand, the more contact you're going to have with the floor. Imagine you have a table with only one leg. If that leg is a tree, the table is nice and stable. But if that leg is a toothpick, the table is going to shake and fall over easily. Don't be a toothpick, be a tree. Open your hand wide. Next thing that needs to happen is that I move my shoulder on top of the supporting hand. Here the first interesting thing happens. On two hands, our weight is in between the hands, meaning we're using mainly our chest and anterior deltoid muscles. When we now transfer our towards the side, we're going to involve the posterior deltoids a whole lot. We didn't use them before at all, which means they're not trained to support our weight. We have to actually prepare the posterior deltoids before we even start training for the one-arm handstand. A good way of doing that is practicing narrow handstands, simply placing your hands a little bit closer towards each other. If you have really massive shoulders, and I'm not talking about massive like me, like actually massive, like big, big shoulders, narrow doesn't mean hands touching each other. Narrow just means what is shoulder wide to everyone else. Narrow hands since really depends on you. How flexible are you? What are you used to regularly in your handstand? And you just try to put your hands closer towards each other. Don't rotate your hands. Keep them facing exactly towards the front. That's a great way of training your posterior deltoids. Now, we've looked at the hand, we've brought our shoulder on top. The next part is, for most, the most difficult part. We need to side bend. We need to bring the opposite hip on top of this already aligned hand and shoulder. That is the tricky part. We need to do the side bending without rotating and without getting out of line. Basically, imagine that you're on a toaster. You do not want to burn your feet. You don't want to burn your bum. 
You don't want to burn anything. You have to stay perfectly in line. It's very difficult. This requires specific flexibility, specific strength, specific coordination. All of this has to come together. The only way really to get good at side bending in a handstand is to practice side bends in a handstand and to practice them a lot. You're going to start at the wall. You're going to then slowly take them off the wall. A really nice way of practicing deep side bends is actually practicing very close to the wall. So your feet tap the wall as soon as you rotate and you know that you're making a mistake. Let's pretend you're good at all of this. The last thing that's really missing now is taking the hand off the floor. This is where most of the mistakes happen and we're going to get into the main mistake that happens here a little bit later. We need to take this hand off the floor whilst keeping both shoulders as low as possible. We need to keep elevating both of our scapulas to stay nice and stable. This means basically this free hand should come far out towards the side. Also, since we're on the floor, your elbow has to bend when you take the hand off because if your elbow doesn't bend, your hand is basically stuck on the floor. You want to imagine you have like a string attached to your elbow that's pulling your hand out towards the side. So simple as that. Look at your hand, bring your shoulder on top of the hand, side bend, take your other hand off the floor, put it forward to the side, keep both shoulders low, close towards the floor. That's all there is really. A couple special mentions here are scapular elevation. There are some people who are able to one-arm handstand without scapular elevation and even with bent elbows. That brings us back to the point, what's sustainable, what's efficient, what's pretty. Scapular elevation is by far the most important strength that you need to develop to hold your one-arm handstand. Some people are going to argue, no, it's core, you got to do your sit-ups, you got to do your planks, you want to stand on one hand. Not really. Like, think about it. If you're just balancing on one foot on a little stool, reaching for the cookie jar on the top shelf, you are bending towards the side, reaching out with one hand, picking up something hopefully heavy because hopefully there are lots of cookies for you, right? Your core is working really strong, stabilizing the position. On one hand, we're trying to align ourselves in an efficient way. So theoretically, the core is actually working less. The thing is just that now the core has to work upside down, meaning it has to re-coordinate all of this. And that re-coordination, that's really what's going to take some time. Coming back to scapular elevation though, picture your scapula as a triangle. If my shoulder is depressed, meaning it's all the way down, it can move left, right, front, back. There's lots of room for movement. There's lots of room for error. The more that you elevate your scapula, the more that you push that shoulder joint up into the triangle's tip, the less movement there can possibly be, the more stable you will be. And with this, the easier your one-arm handstand will be. Really important though is also that the more elevated you are, the healthier your one-arm handstand gets. So when working towards the one-arm handstand, Always start with elevation. Always put elevation first. If you're working through your training, you're getting too tired, you realize you're really losing scap elevation, cut your training short. Cut your sets in half. Do whatever it takes, but you have to stay tall on your shoulder. Secondly, where does the weight actually have to be when we're doing a one-arm handstand? Now, as I said, I'm looking at the first knuckle of my index finger. So you're going to place most of your weight right there. The idea is to be able to control your one-arm handstand with every single finger on the floor. So no matter which way you're falling, you can apply pressure and to put yourself back. But you always want to keep in mind, if you're in your one-arm handstand, falling out towards the outside, you have all of these side-bending one-arm flag positions that you can fall into. If in a straight one-arm handstand, you're falling towards the inside, there's nothing there. You cannot push yourself back besides putting that second hand down onto the floor. That's why it's really important to always put a little bit more weight into the pinky finger side of the hand because you're able to fall into this direction and push yourself back. Now let's pretend you understand how to do one-arm handstand. You've done a whole lot of training and it's finally time to get your very first one-arm handstand. What's important to know is that chances are high you're not going to do your first one-arm handstand on the floor. Instead, you're probably going to be doing it either on handstand blocks or on canes. Both of them have the advantage that your hand is not flat. Your hand is grabbing something. Being able to grab something allows you that in case you fall towards the back of your hand, you're going to be able to pull yourself back up using your fingertips. Now, this concept does seem quite unbelievable if you're just getting started with handstands. But I promise you, down the road, when you're getting really good at one-arm handstands, you can actively use your fingers to pull yourself back up, assuming that you're on handstand blocks. Now, of course, for this, you really have to be quite good. You have to realize very early on that you're falling towards the side of your stomach and your reaction has to be quick, precise, and perfectly timed. Blocks give you significantly more control over your one-arm handstand. You have to train on blocks. It is essential. Additionally, most of the progressions that I'll be giving you to train for the one-arm handstands do involve handstand blocks. Important to mention here is that you do not have to go online and buy a piece of wood for 80 bucks. You can go to Home Depot, Canadian Tire, Bauhaus, no matter where. They usually all have this scrap wood section where you can just cut wood 
you will sand it down a little bit, toss some hockey tape on top, not on the bottom to keep them nice and stable. You literally have six perfect handstand blocks. It's going to take a two hours, a little craftsmanship. You're going to pay 20 bucks, that's it. I also sell my own handstand blocks, but they're not always available. So when they do get back into stock, you got to be quick. Besides handstand blocks, you can train on canes. Canes are basically two sticks with your blocks attached on top of them. They really come with two advantages. Number one is that you're going to be able to slide your hand down from the block towards the floor and then take it out towards the side, making the transition from setting up to the one-arm handstand to actually doing the one-arm handstand significantly easier. The second thing, and this is what most people don't see straight away, is that the little movement of the canes, this little bit of shaking, actually makes your one-arm handstand significantly easier. Because, let me explain, the little shake pushes you back into position. If you're on a cane and you're falling out towards the right, the cane bends with you, and with this your hand moves back underneath you and kind of pushes you back up. Again, this sounds like a pretty distant concept, but I promise to you, it makes a huge difference. There are plenty of professional hand bouncers who can do incredible things on canes, but are not able to do a one-arm handstand, and some of them not even two-arm handstands on the floor. Another thing that's important about getting your first one-arm handstand, for 99.9% .9 of you, your first one-arm handstand is either going to be in a straddle or in a diamond position. If you have a decent middle split, you're going to learn the straddle one-arm handstand first. If your middle split is not so good, you will learn the diamond one-arm handstand first. An argument might be that, oh, my straddle is bad, I'm going to do a straight one-arm handstand first with like legs together all long and cool. That is long and cool, of course, but it is significantly harder. Just trust me with this. I've taken so many people by the hand and guided them towards their one-arm handstand. And so far, I've not met one who learned their one-arm handstand first with legs together. You're going to learn your straddle first. It is significantly easier. You're shorter, your center of gravity is closer to the floor, plus your legs are open wider. You can use them for balance and you're less likely to rotate out. Now, to the question that every single one of you guys is waiting for, why are we rotating out of the one-arm handstand? Well, in other words, why fingertip holds are ruining your one-arm handstand gains? Like, honestly, it is that simple. Let's start with the problem of rotating out of your one-arm handstand. Every single time when you get onto one hand and you take your hand off the floor, and you pull your free shoulder, the one of the hand that's not on the floor, up, away from the floor, your lat engages. Now, the problem of this naughty, naughty lat is that it's not just attached to the shoulder. The way a muscle works is that it attaches to two ends, and these two ends are being pulled towards each other. Now, when you're standing on one hand, you're fragile. The rest of your body is not very stable. When this lat now engages to pull the shoulder up, the hips get pulled towards the shoulder meaning your hips get pulled back down. That's the first thing that happens when you're doing your one-arm handstand. If you're rotating, that's what happens. I know it for a fact. Don't try to argue this. Your hips get pulled back to parallel. You're falling out of your one-arm handstand. That's problem number one. Problem number two is that the shoulder never just comes up. The shoulder always comes up and goes towards the back. It always does this. The problem is that the body follows the shoulder, meaning if your shoulder goes towards the back, your entire body will follow and go towards the back. And that's why you're rotating and falling out of your one-arm handstand. The solution here is to learn to keep your shoulder down. Keeping your shoulder down by the ear, meaning both shoulders staying elevated, is not easy. Especially for dudes who have a little bit more muscle, this becomes very difficult. There's a big question of coordination, habit building, and extreme focus. The unfortunate thing is that you basically have to practice this on one hand. The bottleneck here being that you can't stand on one hand. So we need to think of certain progressions that we can do in order to get rid of the shoulder pulling up and to practice keeping the shoulders low and well isolated. Practicing this, as we've just realized, is not that simple. One thing that is very simple is, from the start, not building this habit. One of my students just recently learned to one-arm handstand faster than anyone else that I've ever seen. And he straight away learned to one-arm handstand on both sides and he could do flags and almost everything. And I truly believe it's, because he only trained the way that I told him. He didn't really look left and right into other programming on YouTube to other influencers or coaches or whatever. He followed precisely my programming. And he never did these piano holds, these fingertip holds, the one finger or two finger one arm handstands. He never did any of this. Allowing him to never even build the bad habit or get the idea to pull his free shoulder up. We never ever had this problem to deal with. And with this, we never hit that plateau. So what I can recommend to you is to simply not work fingertip holds. Just cut them out of your life. There are so many other good and efficient progressions that we're going to discuss in just a minute that you should never do them. Now, your argument point might be you're doing fingertip holds, but your shoulder's staying low. It's unlikely. 
It's very unlikely that you came to this podcast hoping to learn the one-arm handstand when you can do a fingertip hold with your shoulder being low. Most of the time when we do fingertip hold, two things happen. Number one, it's your shoulder is way high up because your elbow is straight. When you take your hand off now, your shoulder is up, you're rotating out, you're falling out. Or for some miraculous reason, when you're taking the hand out towards the side, you're putting your shoulder down towards the floor the way you should be on one hand. Now, the problem with that is that your position from the hand being on the floor to the hand leaving the floor is changing so drastically that you're still going to fall out. So moral of the story really is that your fingertip hold or your one finger hold is not at all the efficient or correct way to get to your one-arm handstand. The real problem here is your coach's lack of knowledge for progressions. That is the reason why most people don't succeed with their one-arm handstand practice. And that's not your fault. How would you know more progressions towards your one-arm handstand? You're not the expert here. Someone helped you train for the one-arm handstand and someone missed the opportunity to give you good progressions. What do most coaches give their students when it comes to the one-arm handstand? Most coaches start by giving some side bends. That is great. You have to practice side bends. Do you know how to properly do a side bend? Chances are high you don't. Then most coaches give fingertip holds and one-arm attempts. Now, we went from something that's difficult but achievable to attempts, something completely unachievable. This is like training level two and then training level 25. It is our duty to put as many steps as possible between these two ridiculously big steps. And I've spent the past, I would say almost 10 years, mapping out exactly what should be the steps, which are essential, which can be skipped, how can we make sure we get there, without frustration, without plateaus. The single best way of practicing 41 arm handstand is having one hand on a handstand block or a yoga block or something similar and the other one on the floor. Now, we're going to call this position the Miami handstand because I had the genius idea for this in Miami and because I love Miami. Your block elbow is going to be bent, your shoulders parallel to the floor, hips parallel to the floor. At this point, your handstand has nothing to do with a one-arm handstand. You're looking in the middle, you have equal weight on both hands. This is going to be our starting position that we're working out from. You need to get comfortable here first. If this is difficult, everything else afterwards is going to be even more difficult. You need to be comfortable here. And now the shortest and most efficient way to get to the one-arm hands with as little progressions as possible would be to look at the floor hand, transfer on top of the floor hand as discussed earlier in the very beginning, and then take this block hand, put it down to the floor, come back to the middle on two hands. You basically step off the block with a whole lot of control. You can then transfer out, put the hand back onto the block. This little step, doing this clean and properly, will literally teach you everything you absolutely have to know to get your first one-arm handstand hold. Now, of course, you shouldn't use just this one exercise to get to your one-arm handstand. But for the frame of this episode, this one exercise truly is enough to get you going and to teach you the concept of the one-arm handstand. Another really important exercise you can add into the rotation is lateral walks. Take three, four, five, or even six blocks, place them close to the wall, Get up into a chest wall handstand, either with your legs together or with your legs in a baby straddle. Imagine you would have three feet, the invisible feet, the non-existent feet being in between the two other feet. And you're simply going to look at the hand, transfer over, take a step, look at the other hand, transfer over, take a step. You're going to walk down and back up on the wall. If you don't have blocks, you can even do that just on the floor. Good thing here would be to draw some targets on the floor so you can make sure you keep your hand distance constant and you actually have something to, to aim for and you're not just walking into the room and back. These lateral wall walks are a really great way to practice alignment because what are you basically doing? We're lining ourselves up for the one-arm handstand and as soon as we found the right alignment, we take a step and we move on. We again line ourselves up, we take a step and we move on. Once you kind of get a hang of the alignment, you can use this as a really good conditioning exercise to get really strong for your one-arm handstand. Something that I definitely encourage everyone doing is film yourself from the back. Compare your videos to my videos on social media, on Instagram and on YouTube and study where is your form different from mine so you can improve your form and actually get your one-arm handstand much faster. Don't just look at the videos and think, oh, this is not nice, this is not nice. No, actually analyze them, pay attention. The more that you learn yourself about one-arm handstands, the more critical you can become about one-arm handstands the faster your one-arm handstand progress is going to be. Training protocols and programming when it comes to the one-arm handstand can be tricky in a way because we need to spend a lot of time training one-arm handstands. Most of my clients that succeed with one-arm handstands train at least four, better five, or possibly even six times per week. The idea is basically that we want to train as much as possible while still being able to recover. One-arm handstands are not a strength drill. They're very technical. To get good at something technical, you have to do this technical thing a lot. 
You need to improve body awareness, upside down coordination. You basically need to do it so much that your body truly feels comfortable in the movement and accepts this one-arm handstand as its new reality. The one-arm handstand is something difficult. It is a high-level skill and your training program should reflect that. You need to create a training routine based on your one-arm handstand gains. So we're going to train four to six times per week. Each session is going to be about 90 minutes. What exactly happens inside of the session, we're going to discuss just a little bit later. And we need to include conditioning to make sure that we're strong enough for the one-arm handstand, but also stay well balanced. And here's where things can get tricky. You want to include hence the push-up conditioning, planche conditioning, style press conditioning, these kind of things at the end of your one-arm handstand session. One thing that you could, for example, do is you choose one of those goals and for the next three months, you're going to include them three times a week at the end of your session. Now, keep in mind that planches, handstand push-ups, and starter presses all are rather anterior deltoid heavy. Whilst training for one is not exactly going to improve the other, training your planche will help keep your handstand push-ups solid and vice versa. So you don't have to include all of these goals into each of your training cycles, but keeping one of them three times a week is going to truly help you build that shoulder strength that you need for the one-arm handstand. Additionally, of course, you also need to do lots of pulling work. We're training one-arm handstands four to six times a week, which means four to six times a week, we are basically overhead pressing in a way, the elbows stay locked, but still, we're pushing a lot. So to stay balanced, we have to pull. I would recommend at this point to do at least two pulling workouts per week. Pulling can be either at the gym, lap pull down, cable roll, bend over roll, the traditional lifts, but you can also do calisthenics pulling, such as pull-ups, front lever rows, front lever training, these kind of things. Please don't forget about your legs. I know it's not the popular thing in the calisthenics scene, but we got to train legs. I don't recommend lifting super heavy. Not just for legs, in general. If you're training for the one-arm handstand, try to lift less weight with maybe with higher reps. But heavy weights are always going to be heavier on your joints, making your one-arm handstand training significantly harder. You still have to train some legs, so you could go for runs, you could go for power walks. Honestly, anything at all is going to be better than nothing. Just make sure you continue to train your legs. Now, getting into your actual one-arm handstand training, your workouts should be structured as followed. Obviously, we're going to start with more of a general warm-up. We always do general warm-ups at the beginning of our training to break a sweat, to get our heart rate up, and to get ready for training. From here, I would recommend to just straight away include a couple stretches. Say, six sets of hamstring middle split stretches can be enough here. Of course, the more flexible your legs are, the easier your one-arm handstand is going to be, because as discussed earlier, the straddle one-arm handstand is the easiest. So if you have flexible hips, the one-arm handstand gains will come faster. After your stretches, we're going to get into wrist, shoulder, and back prehab work. This is so very essential. We've just discussed that we're training six times a week one-arm handstands, which means our shoulders and our wrists are taking a lot of heat. You have to take care of them. It is your responsibility to stay healthy. You're making nice and steady gains. If you don't keep your body healthy, you have to stop. Every time you stop training for the one-arm handstand, you're not going to, in two months, take off where you left off. No, you're basically going slowly backwards for two months. This prehab work is possibly the most important work. It's not only going to prime your muscles and joints not to get injured during a session, but it's also going to allow you to basically catch an injury before it really happens. Say, for example, your shoulder rotator cuff is getting a little bit more tired, it's getting a little bit sore. Doing your shoulder warm-up, you're going to be realize, wow, I can feel something different here. I should take it easy today. If you wouldn't have done this and you simply jump up in a handstand, this might have been too much pressure and you might have actually injured yourself. With these checkup exercises at the beginning of your workout, you're basically able to make sure your body is healthy enough to get up onto your handstands. And you should do this every single workout. After our prehab work, we're going to get started with handstands. And you should stop always by training easy handstand progressions. Two arm drills leg circles, single leg circles, tucks, whatever it is that you're currently working on on two hands, you're going to do this at the beginning of your one-arm handstand session. It's important to start with easier handstand progressions because you need to warm up your feeling for balance and your upside-down awareness. To give you a little story out of my own career, I was able to stand on one hand well, but it still took me at least an hour of warming up on two hands and going through different drills and progressions in order to get stable on one hand. That's just how the game goes. The first couple years, you have to warm up your feeling for balance for a very long time. Your handsets are going to improve a lot throughout your session. And you're starting not at zero, but pretty low at the beginning of every single session, especially after a day off. 
which is why frequency and consistency is so very important. Now, once you've done your regular two-arm handstand warm-up, you're going to include narrow handstands into this mix. Once you get in the hang of the narrow handstand, only just two sets are going to be enough. You're basically touching base, so they're still there, giving your posterior deltoids a little, a little love, a little jiggle, to remind them that they have to work to wake them up and to just continue challenging yourself in that way. But you also don't want to spend too much time here. Because from here, we're going to straight away go into the side bend training. Now, this is where you're going to take more time. You're going to warm up your side bends in a standing progression, like the upright progression that is not on your hands. Then you're going to practice side bends against the wall and off the wall. Again, you want to make sure your elbows stay locked, scapula is elevated. In your regular side bends, your hips want to kind of travel out like, like a rainbow with your bum, but your shoulders shouldn't move. And you want to look in the center of your hands, not on one hand. So these side bends, while they're actively trading towards your one-arm handstand, we almost want to feel like there's still a two-arm handstand. Now that you're finally done with all of this, now it's time for your one-arm progressions. And depending on how deep down the rabbit hole of one-arm handstands you are, this one-arm handstand progression training can be the last 5 or 10% of your session or... 70% of your session. It just really depends how many one-arm handstand drills are you able to do yet and how good are you at one-arm handstands at this particular moment. There's not really a point of practicing one-arm handstand drills if you're just constantly falling out and falling out and falling out. There's also not so much use of practicing one-arm handstands against the wall. One-arm handstands are very three-dimensional. They're very complex. And I've come to realize over many years of, of coaching that it's much more efficient to do slightly easier drills, but do them well. Actually get in volume, get in repetitions. 90% of the drills that you practice should work. Only 10% of the drills should be challenging where you fall out. Most of your handstand training should always be successful. This is going to allow you to gradually overload your body, but also to, to train your mind to truly believe that you're able to do a handstand. One of handstands are very mental. You need to really believe that you're able to do it. Now, of course, at the end of this one-arm handstand session, you want to include conditioning work. As mentioned earlier, two, three times a week, this could be your handstand push-up, overhead pushing, bend arm, straight arm strength kind of work. Two or three times a week, it definitely should be one-arm handstand specific conditioning, being one-arm handstand endurance work, and especially one-arm scapular elevation and stability strength. To save time, of course, here at the end, you can also include your pulling or even your leg work right away. But this really is going to come down to very specific programming and what exactly your training cycle is currently indicating you should do. Expectations, or in other words, staying motivated the long term. Now, getting your one-arm handstand, it's going to take a long time. Honestly, if you're serious about this, you're going to be in it for a couple of years probably. And this is why progressions are so very important. If the only exercises you know are side bends, fingertip holds, and one-arm attempts, you're going to get discouraged very, very fast because six months to 12 months in, you're still training the same progressions and you're probably not seeing big results because you're not training efficiently enough for strength to do your one-arm handstand out of strength. You're not at all training efficiently for techniques, so you're not making technical gains there. You're really just kind of doing the same thing over and over and over again miraculously hoping for a change. Having lots of small progressions in place is going to allow you to every week or every second week to celebrate a tiny little success. Burnouts do happen, but burnouts only happen when we stop winning. This is like the vicious cycle of training. If you're having fun, training is good, you're making gains and you're having fun. But as soon as you're not making gains, you're not having fun. And if you're not having fun, you're not making gains. We have to continue to have fun. We have to continue to win in order to be able to continue to make gains and to continue to win and to continue to have fun, right? It's the endless circle of training. The best way of constantly winning is having as many tiny progressions as possible. And really important, when you go to the gym tomorrow and you're training, don't train for your one-arm handstand. Forget about your one-arm handstand. Try to get as good as possible at your current progression. This over the long game, is really going to make the difference that you're looking for. To the question how long it's going to take you to learn your one-arm handstand, because I know every single one of you guys wants to know this right now, there's no definite answer to this. Too many factors go into play. What's your starting position? How often, how consistently are you able to train every single week? How fast does your body adjust? How strong are your shoulders? How well do your shoulders open? How wide do your legs open? All of these things go into account. I've had clients learn a one-arm handstand in six to nine months. I also have clients who took three years to learn a one-arm handstand. 
The beauty is that if you stick with it, you stay focused, and you work on the right progressions, you will get your one-arm handstand. And there's no age limit to it either. I've had a student in her 60s who's able to one-arm handstand. I learned a one-arm handstand when I was like 16. You can learn to one-arm handstand at any age. It's just going to take time, consistency, and focused effort. All of this training, of course, brings the very logical question, what about the risk of injuries? Will you get hurt training for the one-arm handstand? The good thing basically is that handstands, and especially one-arm handstands, they're not a dynamic load. So acute, direct accident injuries are less likely to happen. I've had a client hurt their finger because they tried to do a one-arm handstand attempt and they were really not ready and then they stabbed their finger onto the floor. So yeah, you can theoretically hurt yourself. But that only happens when you're doing things you're not supposed to. The downside of this is that most injuries come as overuse injuries. Now, as described earlier, if you are doing your prehab work every single day, you're going to be able to spot overuse injuries quite early. But you can't always spot them. The way that I see overuse injuries is that you almost want to have a few overuse injuries, but only to a really slight degree. Tiny, tiny little overuse injuries. Because if you never get to the point where you get so sore that you might think you're injured, you will never know where this line actually is of how far you can push your body. And especially you won't know how does your body feel and react when you're working towards an injury. And I think that knowledge is something that's really, really important for an athlete, especially an athlete who's working for higher level skills, such as the one-arm Hansen. You need to understand in times of high pressure, in times of trying to make a lot of gains, how far you're able to push your body and how will your body react when you're about to get injured. Most of these injuries really are going to happen in three places. In the back, due to side bending. Most of these back side bending injuries happen because you warmed up wearing a sweater, then you didn't warm up your side bends really well, you took your sweater off because, well, we all know why we take our sweaters off, let's be honest. A little bit of cold wind came, caught the wind, caught the sweater on your back, your back got real cold, you did side bends, and you woke up the next day real stiff putting heat on your back, possibly putting ice on your back, taking two, three days off from the side bending from handstands in general can make the difference that you're looking for here. One thing that I recommend is wearing kind of like a kidney warmer. You know those hand-knitted ones that they make for, I think they make them originally for pregnant women. I wear them too. I hope you don't have to be pregnant when you wear them. I hope the police not going to come because of that. But they're basically going to keep your back warm without adding stability. Because that's a really, really important thing. You could theoretically also take a neoprene wrap and wrap it around you really tightly. That's going to keep the heat in, but it's going to add so much stability to your back that if you ever take this wrap off while then training your side bends or your one-arm headstands, you're going to feel super unstable. I don't recommend this. Find something that keeps you warm but does not add stability. Lowering down, we get to the shoulders. Shoulder injuries unfortunately happen, but they're most of the time overuse injuries and you can pretty much always spot them ahead of time. Take your prehab work serious. When your shoulders start to hurt, take a step back. Consider icing your shoulders after your workouts to keep inflammation low. That's going to help. Wrist pain will happen. I don't know one person that learned to one-arm handstand who didn't cry about their wrists. Couple recommendations are train on blocks. Definitely train as much as you can on blocks. Blocks are significantly more gentle on your hands and wrists than training on the flat floor. When you have blocks, don't use white blocks. Cut them quite narrow so that your hand doesn't get spread out on the block. Theoretically, the more narrow the block, the more gentle it is for your wrist. The more narrow the block, the less control you're going to feel with this block. So you need to find whatever is the healthy balance for you. If you have really stiff wrists like me, you could consider using blocks that are on a slight decline. This will allow you to take some of the heat out of your wrists with that train more with less pressure. Key really to not getting wrist problems is building your practice slowly over time, increasing work volume slowly, but also keeping your form and especially scapular elevation high. If you sink into your shoulders, they don't just get unstable, they also move towards the front. If your shoulders move towards the front, the angle in your wrist sharpens, and with this you're creating significantly more pressure for your wrists. Pushing out tall from the shoulders will keep this angle a little bit bigger, will keep pressure smaller, but also just this activation of pushing out will help you engage your forearms as well, further protecting your wrists. For my experience, the best approach that has worked for all of my clients, fellow athletes, and honestly saved my career, icing your wrists. Right after your training, you're going to put your wrists into ice water for 8 to 12 minutes and a second time at night right before bed. Now, there's always been different opinions when it came to icing, but especially in these recent weeks, opinions when it comes to ice baths have been wild. They are the best thing in the world or they will be what ruins your life. 
For my understanding, there is a big argument that ice baths are not ideal when you're trying to build strength because the inflammation actually helps you to get stronger. But if your goal is to get back into the gym for your next workout as early as and as quickly as possible, then ice baths are great because they're going to help you reduce inflammation. Now, remember earlier I said one-arm handstands are not as much about strength, but more and more technique. This is why our training frequency and volume has to be so high. Based on that belief, it is clearly a good idea to ice the wrists and with that be able to train sooner again. Long story short, when it comes to injury prevention, key really is to simply listen to your body, to progressively overload the body, and to understand when to take breaks. Last thing that I want to touch on today is the future. Let's assume you're able to hold your one-arm handset. You've gone this entire road. What's next for you? Well, the problem really is that one-arm handsets, especially one-arm handset gains, are super, super addictive. Every single time that you think, damn, I'm going to learn this little trick and that's going to be my mountain peak and I'm going to be so happy when I'm up there. Just before you arrive at that mountain peak, you're going to see the next one and the next one and the next one. It's a constant flow of wanting to get better. That's amazing. It's going to motivate you to live healthy, to stay focused, to stay training, but it's also never going to let you go. It's like the evil side of hand balancing. Once you are able to hold your one-arm handstand, interesting things to work on are going to be putting your hand up towards your leg, making it significantly harder to keep your shoulder low. Flax, so side-bending one-arm handstands. For athletes who are on the stronger side, they're often a bit easier because they're less about balance and you can just kind of lay on your side. You can lay on your oblique muscles. Important here is that you keep your elbow locked and your scapula elevated. The side bend should not be happening in your shoulder, but between your last rib and the hip bones. This is essential. A good way of checking that your one arm, but also two arm side bends are good, is that your chin stays connected with the anterior deltoid. As soon as your chin is not touching the shoulder anymore, as soon as the side of your face is not touching the shoulder anymore, you can know for a fact that you're sucking into your shoulder, your elbow is bending, and your form is not great anymore. Besides side bending one arm headsets, you're also going to want to learn the figas. Figures are much more difficult, they're much more technical. It's basically when from a straddle hands then you take your outside leg, you're rotating it around, basically doing an upside down pancake. Now your feet both point in the direction of your inside hand, while your shoulders actually stay mobile. Not easy, long road, but we can all get there if we stay focused. And that pretty much sums it up. This is everything I had planned today for this intro to One Arm Handstands episode. I think it was quite a lot that we covered, but there's so much more that I would like to tell you guys about the One Arm Handstand. I have more episodes prepared, specifically towards the one-arm handstand. But finishing these episodes is going to be so much easier if I know what are your questions and what wasn't discussed today. What else do you want to learn about? So please do me the favor, head down to the comment section and let me know what are your questions so I can make sure to include them into future episodes. If you want to start training for your one-arm handstand more seriously and more consistently, then head down into the show notes and follow the link. Work your way through the customization on my website and request your free one arm handstand workout right now. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm looking forward to training with you guys. I'm going to see you next time. And if this episode helps you and you're going to make some one arm handstand gains, make sure to post them and tag me in them. I want to see how you guys are doing. I'll see you next time.